first up on this BA Deep Sky section webinar for today. I'm very pleased to, to welcome Chris Lee. Um, I guess many BA people probably know Chris from his endeavours at the UK, uh, UK space. Um, it changes its name so often, I'm not sure <laughs> or, or what, what his actual role was there in previous like, times, but I think he may have spoken at uh, Rutherford Labs and, um, and, and other other meetings, maybe, uh, or maybe I've just got that completely wrong. But uh, anyway, uh, Chris has been involved in, uh, in, in UK space for many, many years. And uh, I think now that he's retired from that, um, he's now become... Uh, uh, active with uh, electronically assisted astronomy, so he's been posting up lots of interesting images on, on Twitter, um, and uh, I've been enjoying his work over the uh, the past couple of years. Um, so I thought uh, we'd uh, we could ask him to give a little talk on EA since it's one of the hottest topics of the of uh, current uh, observational techniques, and uh, and. Uh, uh, invite him along tonight. So, um, without any further ado, we'll uh, pass over to Chris and uh, uh, take it from there. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Callum. Let me uh, try and share the screen. <clears throat> so, can you uh, can you see that? All okay. Yep, looking good. Perfect. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, thanks, Callum. Yep. So. Um, I'm currently are still active in uh, in amateur astronomy. Um, do a little bit of work with the University of Leicester, but yeah, it's been a couple of years since I left the UK Space Agency. Um, and um, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is what I decided to do as part of my hobby, part of my retirement activities. Um, the old world I lived in uh, was very much um, for years using uh, my eight inch uh, uh, SCT to observe the world of faint fuzzies. Uh, those of us who uh, have been in the game long enough know quite well what we mean by faint fuzzies, but I was always very keen on sketching. Uh, and so I ploughed my way through sketching all of the Messier objects. Uh, and while I was absolutely thrilled to be able to, to catch them all, uh, in reality, I didn't see a great deal of detail. As you can see on a sketch on the right-hand side of the whirlpool, uh, I was delighted to be able to see you know, at least two blobs, but literally, blobs was the uh, was the watchword. Um, when I retired in 2020, um, I'd already um, had a crack at the Messiers, um, but I'd never really managed to get too many of the cold walls, partly because being nebula, there was just simply weren't um, visible with, with my eight inch uh, in terms of resolution uh, and terms of color. And I had set myself the opportunity to look at a whole range of objects, including the Herschel objects um, and with the, the Stephen O'Meara bo uh, books. And I wondered whether perhaps it was time to think about the way I did my astronomy. Um, should I go for a different type of telescope, perhaps a wider, wider field of views? Um, should I perhaps go for a higher resolution, you know, nine, nine and a quarter or something like that? Or should I move into astrophotography uh, because I would have had the time to, to start looking into this? Um, and I was conscious that there were one or two other uh, people out there in Claudia Nights who were beginning to talk about new technique. And the new technique really was um, stacking in real time uh, using effectively what is known now as electronically assisted astronomy, essentially stacking one image on top of another uh, while effectively while you're at the scope you don't actually look through the eyepiece you have a camera attached to the eyepiece but you build up the image um, in software and it's usually displayable on something like a, an ipad or um, or an iphone uh, and i wondered really about whether i should move into that world typically images are between 20 and 30 minutes exposure uh, and this isn't astrophotography where you're literally taking the telescope images overnight going to bed getting up the next morning, looking at your uh, your computer, it's got mail, as it were, and you then spend the rest of the day processing the images. I, I really wanted to continue to be able to observe from the scope. So do I use my eight inch with some kit or do I start again? The smart scopes that are out there on the market, uh, there are more now than there were when I started a couple of years ago, um, but typically between 500 and 3000, um, and while they're all very self-contained, the optics are quite small. Uh, and I felt in reality, I'd like to see a little bit deeper. Uh, and so since I had the eight inch, 
I decided to make up my own EEA um, uh, set, if you like. But it was a self-contained world uh, because I opted to go for the ZWO ASI Air route. So the first thing I, I did was to acquire um, a small computer. It's uh, basically an Astro Berry uh, type computer with a Wi-Fi extender because the version I had, the ASI Air Pro, didn't have particularly good Wi-Fi signal. So I boosted it with an extender. I bought myself a camera. I bought the um, 533 um, cooled color camera uh, and it's a square chip. So uh, it was quite similar to looking through an eyepiece. Uh, it wasn't an oblong rectangular type, type system. I had to acquire some filters for that. Um, I acquired a UVIR, I acquired a light pollution and um, an H-alpha um, filter. And then importantly, from my point of view, I had to get uh, a corrector, an SCT corrector, because I found when I started that the eight inch um, sometimes had difficulty in plate solving um, at that high level of, of, of F number um, around F10. Uh, and really, I had to stop it down to around F7, a wider field of view, uh, which allowed the plate solving to work more, more easily, more reliably. But of course, it had the added advantage. It was a brighter image. Therefore, I would lead, need less image time to acquire uh, a particular target that I was looking at. And then over the uh, couple of years I added to that, I treated myself to an electronic focuser so I could operate the focus remotely. When I first started, I, I didn't bother. I just simply sat at the scope and would all be the focus. Um, I've started to extend my imaging to 60 seconds, which forced me to go for a, uh, an OAG device um, to allow the, the system to track more accurately. And then I added a power mate because I also wanted to do some planetary imaging at the same time. And this then is my setup now. Um, I have my eight inch. I put it on um, a Skywatcher uh, AZ EQ mount. Uh, I've got my camera, I've got my electronic focuser, I've got the, um, the the small computer is literally just attached to the side of the scope with the um, Wi-Fi extender. And, and I sit near the scope, but I'm not by the scope. So effectively, I've got a piece of glass between me and the scope where I will sit with a red light and I will read up on the objects I'm currently imaging and I'll have um, an iPad sitting on, on the desk. And typically, I will be observing an object for about 20 minutes. Um, I find that after about 20 minutes, I've read all I want to read about the object. I've seen what I want to see around that object. And I just simply want to move on and acquire um, images from other objects. So again, very much not astrophotography in that I'm taking one target for five or six hours worth of imaging. Uh, so the quality of my images are clearly not going to be as good. But from my point of view, I'm finding them very acceptable. What I have on my iPad or my iPhone is the following screen. Um, effectively, with the iPad, it's got a bit more real estate. This is a screenshot of my iPhone where you'll get a top level menu allowing me to link in to the various parts of my system, my cooler my camera, my um, off-axis guider if I'm using it, or my USB if I want to then dive into some of the images that I've stacked. Um, I have a, a screen that advises me how many seconds I'm observing the image for. Um, I have a histogram uh, at the bottom that I'm able to operate in real time by moving the sliders to, uh, to get slightly um, more colorful or um, uh, darker images to bring out features. And then um, I have uh, information on the target I'm looking at. I can detect the stars and see how sharp they are. Uh, and uh, I also have linked in with the ASI Air. You can see a, an image there of the plow. That will take me to a sky map, a bit like Sky Safari, which allows me to see where my object is in the sky and where my next object might be so that I can prepare in advance for slewing the telescope over to the next object. So it's all pretty well controlled now, simply by myself at the table um, on the iPad. Uh, I will quite often take the images offline um, in the next day and take them into a free 
a package for certainly for the Macintosh. This is a, a Max. This is a good package called Cyril. You will see on this image. You can see a satellite trail coming through. Uh, I quite often find I get many satellite trails. I also have hot pixels popping up all over the place, and so I use this stacking software just to simply clean up the image, uh, and then I will also put it through um, something called Affinity Photo, which is a poor man's version of Photoshop effectively. It's got an excellent astrophotography tool set um, by Jane Gritson. And uh, so I will use this if I decide I want to keep the image and potentially capture it um, for subsequent um, release on, on social media or, or, or whatever. And so what follows now are going to be an example of uh, the images. So um, let's clear off. This is a dark sky deep space uh, group, but I do look at the moon and the planets uh, and because I have the, the camera, I can now do lucky stacking for the planets and similarly for the moon. So um, uh, I do, do spend more time now imaging the planets than I probably did observing. The thing with um, electronically enhanced astronomy, of course, is I can now see color pretty well in real time um, and quite quickly. So all three images here um, would appear very much like this, probably not as bright, on the actual iPad. Um, this is somewhat enhanced. The colors are richer because of the software that you can use offline. But you certainly do see good color um, in a matter of minutes. Uh, and so I'm able to, to crack on through many of the Caldwell objects that up until now I've not really been able to see. I can also look at dark nebulae. Um, so again, these are typically about 20 minutes uh, imaging just using a UVIR. Um, filter. Uh, and so I'm, I'm starting gradually to go through the, the Barnard list. One of the difficulties with the 8 inch is the field of view is very tight. So, for example, the one on the left, the E uh, nebula, required about eight images to be stitched together in a mosaic, which means I don't tend to spend very long on each mosaic. So, in fact, this was nine panels, um, five um, uh, minutes effectively imaging per panel that were then brought together. I can go and have a look at, I used to hate uh, sketching globular clusters. Uh, they were very tricky, as you can imagine, um, but they are probably my favorite objects um, of, of the Milky Way. So again, it was, it was great to be able to simply observe something like uh, M13 or, or M92. Uh, with uh, something like 30 minutes uh, imaging just using the um, the filters. Uh, and again, you get a very good image on the iPad. It's not too dissimilar from what you get with processing offline. But of course, because of EEA, I can start moving deeper. Um, so I was interested to try and see if I could spot the variables um, that Hubble had used uh, during his famous uh, activities looking at variable Cepheids. Um, and so uh, a simple capture of uh, M31 uh, wasn't very long, 20 minute capture. You can see how zoomed in I am with my eight inch, um, but I was able to spot at least a few of the uh, variable Cepheids and uh, went along then to try and find the globular, um, the globular cluster mail two, which is associated with the Andromeda galaxy. Um, so I was quite, quite pleased with that one. But of course, the real beauty is being able to go back through my messiers and start to recognize that the faint fuzzies really were rather gorgeous objects. Uh, and again, looking at the image on the right, my sketch of M51, taken with the same telescope, same garden conditions. Um, but on the left hand side, uh, it's a 30 minute observation. So this is what I would see on the iPad, effectively building up over a 30, 30 minute period. And in fact, really, you get a decent image after about 10 or 15 what you get is noise on the image and gradually the noise fades away as you take more images for the stack. <clears throat> Moving further out with M87, again, an object I'd sketched um, a while ago, but I never could see the, the jet. And I don't know if you can see on the image on the left, um, but I can show you in the enhanced version. You can see the, um, the the jet emerging from the center, effectively being thrown out by by the black hole, uh, and so again, that was a target I'd I'd always wanted to be able to spot, having read about it, uh, and it was pleasing that again after thirty minutes you get a decent enough image 
to be able to see you can just see the perhaps you can't on online but there is a jet there which you can then see enhanced the other thing about electronic um, assisted astronomy is you can then start um, taking part in uh, what you can see uh, announced online or in astronomy uh, societies that there's a new supernova uh, again it's the sort of thing i can never really see with my eight inch uh, because although I'd see the galaxy, uh, they were never particularly uh, distinct. Um, and so it was quite uh, interesting to be able to see the supernova for MO, uh, M101. Uh, that was very recent in 2023. Uh, and then indeed there was another one um, with one of the other messiers. Uh, again, you can just about see, see it. Uh, where the green is, is pointing. So I will now routinely uh, look out for announcements. Uh, Damien Peach, uh, I think he's just announced one, but I don't think I'm able to see that galaxy at the moment from, from where I am. So it, it's great fun being able to go out there and, and observe the supernovas once people have spotted them and, and said that they're around. I can uh, also start uh, seeing you know, shapes and, and structure in more deeper galaxies. So um, the fleas, cold worlds, um, uh, it, it called a number 30 with, with the uh, telescope uh, used. In this instance, I think it was a 40 minute image. So perhaps a bit unfair to say EAA. Um, normally it's 20 to 30 minutes, but this one was such a gorgeous target. I was just very intent on, on capturing um, more uh, images so that I could add to the processing thereafter. I've always wanted to go after the Hicksons. Again, it was something I couldn't do with the 8-inch using it visually, but it's something I can do reasonably easily now with the um, uh, assistance of a camera. So this is Steph Stefan's quintet. Uh, I was curious to see what I could see on this one after um, James Webb Space Telescope uh, put, uh, put forward its, its gorgeous images. Um, and it's you know, it's not a bad not a bad capture, really. Again, 35 um, uh, minutes capture using the, I think this instance, just looking at it, I was just using the UVIR filter. Uh, and again, you can get a bit of color, uh, color, but what was nice was being able to see things like the, the tidal tail, which is uh, uh, something to, to look out for. So I have tried to look at a few of the uh, Hicksons, um, gradually looking at the attractive ones first, and then perhaps eventually looking at some of the, the more indistinct ones. Um, but again, uh, enough information is coming through. Even, I mean, this one on the right here, um, it's uh, it's 120 uh, seconds, but only 15 uh, captures. So I suppose that's still um, a 30 minute image. And on the left hand side here, we've got one of 20 minutes uh, capture. And then uh, the Hickson 93, uh, again, another 20 minute uh, capture. If you were looking at this online uh, on the iPad at the time, it would just appear noisier and probably the background will be greyer than the, the blackness you get with processing. And then, of course, you can really delve deep. Um, it's tricky, but you can see um, some of the colliding ARPs. Uh, so uh, the mice galaxies, the butterfly uh, galaxies, that, that I'm particularly pleased with the butterfly galaxies because you can really get some indication of structure as the two galaxies collide, uh, the antenna galaxy and, um, oops. And it just allows me to go on then to look at even deeper uh, clusters such as the Coma, Leo uh, and Hercules. Uh, and again, uh, it's great fun being able to see these things gradually stack up over 20 or 30 minutes. And then you're literally looking um, on the iPad along with your books trying to see if you can spot and name the particular um, uh, galaxies. And there are software available in the uh, application that will then simply ring the, the more well-known galaxies uh, as, part of, as part of the software. So literally sitting there watching galaxies everywhere. And even further back, I can now look at quasars, um, 3C273 and 3C232. And these were some of my earliest ones in 2020. So at the time, I didn't even have an equatorial mount. I was using an altazimuth and observing for no more than 10 seconds at a time, sometimes 20 seconds, um, just to simply build up before the field rotation would, would cause some issues. But 
sufficient resolution to be able to to see the the, the quasar uh, and then finally going for what people had said to me um on cloudy nights was the furthest object you can see in an amateur scope i mean it's a bit of a cheat because of course it's an object that is 12 billion light years away but we see it because effectively it's bent by um, gravitational lensing um, to true the Earth. <clears throat> and so in this instance, it's a, it's a particular object called APM 08279. Uh, and uh, this is the, the enhanced version here, uh, which you can just see it. And what's nice to see is it's even got the red color um, because of course it is a very, very uh, long way away. Uh, and just to, to prove that uh, it, these things are reasonably straightforward to see uh, because this is the phone shot I put at the beginning of the talk. Um, I went out last night uh, just to see if I could see it again. Uh, I'd seen the previous image a while ago. Um, and this was, um, well, stacked 17 of what was going to be 30-second um, um, captures. So it's just a simple screenshot and you can you can see it, I think, fairly clearly. Um, as the as the object there. So um, all in all, uh, I'm finding my um, interest in astronomy has uh, enhanced considerably now that I no longer just simply look at faint fuzzies and convince myself it's something rather interesting. Uh, I see in 10, 20 minutes something that's both colourful and in detail and, and my enjoyment uh, increases. I'm still not comfortable in taking images overnight and then processing in the morning. I feel that's still a little bit remote from observation astronomy. But whilst I'm sitting in my uh, blast off room, I'm still getting cold. I'm still hearing the sounds of the night sky. Um, so I still think I'm doing astronomy. Doesn't always work the way I want to see it. It's not great. EAA is not great for um, double stars, which is a real pity. Uh, I did like double stars, but uh, Electronic imaging tends to overblow the, uh, the, the the stars themselves, so um, the, only the large ones with, with big distances uh, are obvious targets. It also suffers from um, gusts, so you wouldn't notice it if you're observing with an eye, but when you're observing and you're trying to capture images, um, it's rather frustrating when you're frequently finding your 30-second or whatever shot is um, damaged because of a gust of wind that simply um, moved the eyepiece a touch. And I tried last night in rather difficult conditions, my final shot. I thought I'd have a go at Andromeda's parachute um, quasar. Um, the picture on the left-hand side is from the internet, a chap called Hen, who used an 8-inch SCT and two hours of imaging. And you can just about see it's a, a quad a quasar um, from, gra from uh, gravity lensing. It's got three blobs, one, two, three, and a fourth that makes up vaguely a parachute type of shape. Um, I only spent 10 minutes on it last night. Uh, it wasn't a brilliant night. Oops, and it's got a sort of shape, and it's certainly not a circle. So um, I'll take that as working progress. Anyway, that's that's your lot. Hello, Chris. Thanks very much. Um, just wondering Thank if you. anyone's got any questions. Sure. Want to put them in the Q and A. Um, and if you're um, watching on YouTube, then you can put them in the comments on YouTube. Just, um, just a quick one from from me, Chris. Um, <clears throat> you're you're using a um, corrector um, on the on, on a star Arizona corrector on SCT. Is that a point six three one or the? It's point seven. Point seven, right? Yeah, I had the um, Celestron, but I found it gave. Um, star artifacts that I wasn't so comfortable with, and so um, I'm I'm much happy with the Star Arizona. Please say we've got um, just over forty people watching across Zoom and YouTube, and that was uh, fascinating uh, to hear about, Chris, and very tempting. Uh, have you seen about the announcement by Celestron this week with their new... with their six inch? Yes. Uh, yes, um, and again, it's it, it's probably the way astronomy is beginning to move. Um, six inches is a little bit too too small for me. Um, I I do think I prefer eight, um, or or even in fact, I'd like to be able to use eight at eight. At the moment, I'm stopping it down, as it were. 
<clears throat> but on the other hand, I do quite like Nebula now. So um, you get the breadth as well. well yeah, we're starting to get some questions in. So we've got from Mike Greenhill Hooper. Um, great presentation. Thank you. Um, does your software allow darks and flats calibration as you go along? Um, he use, he uses sharp cap. Yeah. So um, yes, it does. Um, I with the ZWO system, it allows you to do them automatically. Uh, it's a very simple way of using it. Much easier than the normal way you do flats and uh, flats and darks. Um, and it, when you're using live stack, it's using those darks and flats while you're live stacking. So the image is, is after effectively those flats have been taken into account because they're sitting on the stick. Um, I have to tell you, I mean, I'm not, uh, I mean, you know, I perhaps do a flat every three months or four months. Um, I try to make sure there's no dust on my optics, but I just, you know, I just accept that there's going to be some gremlins. And if I really, if I really want gremlins cleared out, I'll just use image processing to, uh, to tidy up the image. So I really don't use flats and darks. Uh, I don't keep upgrading them every night like professionals or, or um, the astrophotographers will do. Then we have a question from William, which is um, he's just wanting to clarify, is it the ZWO software you're using? And have you tried any other software like SharpCat? No, because I decided to get into the closed world. Um, ZWO is a bit like Apple. Um, once you get a camera and then you get a filter, you end up getting the ZWO ecosystem. So it's the ZWO software. I've got their focuser. I've got their filters. I've got their camera. They probably saw me coming. Um, however, like Apple, it is seamless the way it all integrates together. Um, I don't have to worry about Nina and Sharp Cap and you know other variations, uh, PhD and the like. It's all done inside. I do all my alignments and everything is all done within the one the one screen. I like simplicity, frankly. And then we have a question on um, YouTube, which is from Nick Tonkin. And he says, um, you may find an eight inch Newtonian will widen your field of view and will capture images in shorter times at F4. Yeah, so if you if you move down the F numbers, you do get the benefit of um, less observing time. I, I would agree. The nice thing for me about an uh, the uh, SET is it just more manipulable, handleable by me. I have to tear my telescope down every evening and take it into the garage, and then I have to bring it out when I need to use it and set it all up. So I found the SET quite quite attractive from that point of view. All right. Thank you, Chris. There's no more questions at the moment. Pleasure. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions that occur to them later on, then just pop them in the Q&A and uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll get to them at the end of the evening. Um, great, thanks very much, Chris. And uh, we'll uh, move on now to um, our double star advisor, our double star secretary uh, from for the section, John McHugh. I'm very glad that John was able to to make it to, uh, to uh, speak on the webinar tonight. Um, it's a few years since he actually gave a talk to this section. I, I, I'm trying to remember when that was. I, I think it was probably when I was ill uh, and missed the section meeting, which was maybe 2019, maybe, something like that. Um, but, um, um, yeah, very glad to, that uh, that John has been able to come along tonight. Um, this uh, There has been a bit of a... Um, drought, I'm not sure drought of double star observing, um, but um, perhaps it's not being as popular as it has been in the past. Um, and that's something we'd quite like to um, to um, remedy, really, and uh, encourage a few more people to have a go at double star observing. Uh, and if you haven't got any idea how to start, then um, John is the man to talk to. Um, so he's going to give us a quick talk tonight. Um, John's also going to be working on a uh, tutorial about double star observing, which we'll put up on the BA website before too long. Uh, and uh, I hope that'll encourage members to uh, to have a go at doing some double star observing. So um, we'll pass over now to John for his talk on uh, observing double stars. Thank you very much, uh, Callum. And uh, thank you, uh, Chris. Um, that was very useful. 
personally uh, because I have an eight inch uh, SCT as well. And uh, I live in a um, semi rural area about two miles from the coast, about two miles from Saltburn. And I'm um, thinking about um, expanding my astronomy observation onto um, photography. But um, like you, I have a long history and a love of sketching and I don't want to spend hours and hours taking images and days processing them. So um, thank you very much for that, Chris, and I'll have a look at the recording afterwards. But um, I'd like to spend uh, a short time describing my own um, observations in double star observing over the uh, past 15 or 16 years. And I'll see if I can share my screen here now. And there we go. I hope everybody can see my screen and hear me okay. Yep, all looking good, John. Excellent, uh, thank you. Yes, as I say, um, light pollution has been uh, spoiling deep sky viewing uh, for many. But in the last few years, as you've heard Chris say, uh, we can overcome um, uh, sky glow through street lights, light pollution uh, by long exposures with uh, highly sensitive and detailed CCD cameras uh, and processing um, the images, stacking and processing the images. Um, I mentioned that uh, I live in a kind of a semi-rural uh, area, uh, so I'm looking to... Uh, as Chris described, uh, to expand uh, my astrophotography. Uh, and particularly uh, with uh, um, images of uh, double stars with exoplanets going around them. There are a few. Now, obviously, I won't be able to uh, image the exoplanets, but uh, to know that they're there, to find them with my telescope and to image them and know that they're there, uh, and look up details about the properties and nature of the exoplanets uh, would um, be really exciting. I've made a, a, a start on that uh, visually. Um, I'm not far away from the um, northern uh, boundary of the North York Moors National Park. And about three years ago, uh, they were awarded the International Dark Sky uh, Certificate and um, negotiating with the park at the moment to, to build a public observatory uh, in the national park so that we have a dark sky observatory. And uh, that uh, will have a lot of potential for um, observations and for outreach to the public. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, we, we're, uh, we're making progress on this dark sky observatory. Um, I had a look yesterday at uh, the number of international dark sky areas uh, in the UK, and there are actually 18. So, um, and these are genuine international dark sky uh, areas, uh, not um, promotions from campsites that say the skies are dark. Um, yes, in, in urban areas now, as... Uh, as um, Chris has just described, astrophotography has improved so much that um, astonishing images can be, be, can be produced. Um, and it's probably because uh, I have a, a life career in uh, towns and uh, small towns, large towns, that um, I've spent a lot of time observing double stars. And uh, as we know, there are two types. The... Uh, kind of double star where they are actually gravitationally connected um, and the orbital periods of these binaries uh, stretch from a few days to thousands of years. And uh, the other kind of double star, uh, optical doubles, these are stars that you see in the line of sight, of course, uh, similarly to looking up in the sky and seeing a bird in the same line as, of sight as an aircraft. Um, and as I'm sure you know, uh, double stars are, um, they are um, entertaining to find uh, on two counts, I find. Uh, firstly, to enjoy uh, colour contrasts. 
um, it seems easier to see the colours of stars, which vary according to the surface temperatures, of course. Uh, it seems easier to see the colours of stars when they're in close proximity to each other. So you can see the contrast of colours. And uh, the other big challenge of double stars is uh, being able to uh, see that there are two stars there the closer and closer uh, that you that you go. It's um, it's quite a quite a sense of achievement when you can uh, separate a double star that uh, is close to the resolution of your telescope, of course. Uh, on my first screen here, excuse me a second. On my first screen here is the um, basic uh, measurement that um, I've, I was drawn into um, finding um, about, as I say, about 16 years ago. And that is how far apart the two stars are. Here's the primary star. I don't know if you can actually see the cursor on the screen, but uh, there's the primary star, the red one there. And there's the faintest secondary star. Uh, orange one there and if we can measure how far apart they are and measure how they are oriented to each other uh, in terms of the angle from north uh, round towards the east uh, until you meet the uh, the line of uh, connecting the two stars if you can measure those two things then this is crucial to determining whether they are in fact um, a gravitationally bound couple and how often they do actually take to orbit each other. And um, um, I think I'm right in saying that this is still the only way of directly calculating the mass of uh, stars uh, by looking at uh, their, orb their, their uh, orbits around the common centre of gravity. And I've drawn a, an example there. This would have a position angle here of about 135 uh, degrees. And uh, just see if I can get onto the next slide. There we go. Um, I'm hoping to describe uh, tonight various methods of measuring those two uh, uh, quantitative parameters of um, double stars, the separation and the position angle. And uh, this is one uh, which you all have heard of, and you may even even have one of these. It's um, an astrometric eyepiece and uh, the only drawback with these is that they are quite expensive and uh, this uh, extension on the right hand side is the um, is the red light illumination of the reticule on the inside of the um, on the inside of the eyepiece and uh, I've attempted to take a, an image of that reticule with my smartphone <laughs> yesterday um, and uh, here it is and there's the reticule that you see when you look through the eyepiece and uh, in, in, in a dark sky, of course, you need to illuminate that with the, um, with the, the red light from the extension side. Um, you've probably come across these before. Um, I don't know if any observers, of, uh, any, uh, uh, observers watching tonight have, have actually, actually used one of these. Uh, it um it takes a, a little bit of calibration because that uh, line across the middle there that must be calibrated to um to know how far away the two uh, stars in the double R um to determine the separation and to do that you must know um uh, how long it takes a star to drift across the whole scale uh, with the telescope drive switched off, of course. So and knowing how long it takes to drift across the scale, you can tell um, the number of arc seconds per unit on the scale. Uh, it's worth noting, of course, as we're all familiar with eyes to telescopes, that stars further from the celestial equator take longer to uh, cross the scale. Uh, in fact, a star at declination 60 degrees uh, takes twice as long because it uh, costs 60 is a half. And uh, so anyway, when you've um, uh, when you've measured the uh, the time it takes to cross the uh, scale, the uh, 
the time along the scale uh, in seconds will be equal to the uh, uh, equal to that time multiplied by fifteen point oh four one one arc seconds multiplied by cosine of the um, declination angle. And then you divide by 50 to get the number of arc seconds for one scale. Right, anyway, um, when you've got the uh, double in your eyepiece and you know which way in your eyepiece is north and which way is east, you can roughly, you can roughly estimate what the uh, position angle will be uh, of the uh, binary or double that you've got in your eyepiece. And uh, with the double lined up along the middle scale, you then turn the drive off and watch the double, um, or, or particularly the, the primary star, head towards the outside edge of the reticule. And you read off the angle scale when it gets there. And in this case, it's um, 315 degrees. Uh, now, you'll probably find that that doesn't agree with your estimate, as you saw in the eyepiece. And if it doesn't agree, you just add 180 degrees. And uh, in this case, it gives 495, uh, which uh, is beyond a full circle. So we subtract 360 degrees from the 495 and you get 135, uh, which would be your measurement um, of the um, of the position angle. Um, right. Um, so, uh, as I say, that's a, that's a method I've got and I've used. But um, when I was encouraging double star observing um, a few years ago, uh, I was concerned that these astrometric eyepieces are expensive. So I was looking for a cheaper way of, of measuring as accurately as you can, uh, these position angle and the separations. Um, so <laughs> I'm, my, my career is in education as well, uh, maths being a part of it. So I suppose uh, I like to measure things and calculate things. And I thought about using the uh, crosshair uh, eyepiece. And I... Um, I looked. I looked up if there, there was any way of using um, uh, a simple crosshair eyepiece uh, to measure position angle and uh, separation. Uh, there might well be, but I couldn't see one, so I put pen to paper myself and um, work this out. And uh, now there, in the blue square, there, there's the separation of the primary and the secondary. And there's the angle marked theta, the position angle. North is at the bottom and east isn't marked. It's at uh, the right hand side. And what you do first, uh, oh, by the way, uh, I had to do this drawing for the four quadrants of the position angle, not 90, 90, 180, 180, 270, 270 360. And uh, to my extreme relief, the same equations apply uh, for each uh, quadrant. Uh, but I'll just show you the 0 to 90 quadrants um, here uh, this evening. And uh, whoop. <laughs> and um, you can easily, it's just a simple trigonometry this, you can easily check these equations for yourself. Um, what you do is you, uh, is you um, swivel the eyepiece until the crosshairs are aligned east-west. And then you turn your um, telescope motor off and allow it to drift. And you time the secondary star as it drifts towards the north line. So I'm going from B1 to B2. And you end up this, with this equation on the left-hand side. And then you swivel the eyepiece until the crosshairs join the two stars where those dotted lines go there. And um, I described this in an article in the uh, BEA journal actually a few years ago. Um, you'll, you'll probably be able to look that up. Um, so you uh, then swivel the eyepiece until the crosshairs uh, align with the two stars and you time how long it takes the secondary 
with the motor switch stuff again as it drifts to the adjacent crosshair. So it goes from one crosshair to the other and gives you a time B1, B3, and you get those two equations there. And these are simultaneous equations in two unknowns, um, the theta position angle and uh, the separation um, the separation uh, S. And um, does it work? Well, um, this is a graph I plotted um, showing the results of the crosshair method of measuring the separation of six um, selected double stars. <clears throat> uh, these are the double stars down here. There's the famous uh, Albario uh, talking about um, uh, talking about uh, a, a good. Um, Colourful uh, contrast uh, double stars. Uh, this is Albireo. We've all seen this at the uh, at the long end of the um, Cygnus uh, cross. And uh, there are some other fainter uh, double stars: STF three o five three 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 one three o four four. Um, STF, of course, referring to Wilhelm Struve. And uh, the number in his 1827 Dorpat catalogue. And uh, STT251 and STT252. And these are um, from uh, Otto Scrooves. Uh, so it was a family affair, this is uh, Otto Scrooves, 1843, a Pulkova catalogue. And I was quite pleased to see this graph because it shows that uh, the measurements are made of uh, separation with this crosshair method um, are, are quite accurate uh, because I've plotted them against on the horizontal axis the value of separation quoted by the Washington uh, double star catalogue. Um, excuse me. Um, so there's the observed separation that I made with the crosshairs, and there's the value of the separation uh, quoted in the Washington Double Star Catalog, uh, the repository actually of all double star observations uh, in the um, uh, in the world. Uh, just incidentally, uh, I, I did. Um, uh, I have had observations from BAA observers uh, with um, uh, with, a, with, with a double star that couldn't be identified in the catalog. And uh, these can be added to the catalog with your name as an observer, um, provided it's been published in uh, in a journal like like our journal. Uh, I was Pleased uh, to see as well, I don't know if you can see on your screen, that um, I've put error bars on each of these observations uh, shown as a vertical line. And um, these, are, these, are quite, these are quite small, these error bars. So I was pleased with those. And of course, you can see that they match up with the, uh, the dotted line, which uh, is um, which is the line of best fit for my observations. And uh, you can see that um, they're uh, fairly close to um, the, uh, uh, the, the line uh, portraying the Washington Double Star uh, catalog. Uh, that, um, I didn't draw that line for the Washington Double Star catalog if there's an exact um, if there's an exact uh, um, comparison, uh, that of course would go through these points here, which are close to my dotted line of best fit there. Uh, so I was quite pleased with that. Um, I didn't, uh, for, for the purposes of some simplicity tonight, I didn't put in the corresponding comparison with the position angle of the these doubles, um, comparing with the Washington Double Star catalog. Uh, but there was a um, reasonable uh, correspondence again. But one thing I must say uh, to, uh, to uh, as a note of um, warning on this 
is that the error bars for the position angle uh, got quite large at this top end. And uh, that is um, difficult to um, negotiate because this analysis mathematically involves the um, involves the uh, the cosine function, which is non -lin non-linear, of course. So as the angle gets bigger, uh, the error bar is bound to uh, to get bigger as well. Um, so uh, the next step was to engage some BAA double star observers who were very familiar, more familiar than I was, with the astrometric eyepiece to see how the crosshair and astrometric eyepiece methods actually correspond. And uh, this time on the dotted line, I did the uh, uh, the exact matchup between the crosshair method and the astrometric method. In other words, if both methods gave exactly the same answers, they would fall on this dotted line. <clears throat> uh, and uh, I was quite pleased with that result as well, because at the time that I was doing this work about 16 years ago, uh, I was I was happy that um, my, my crosshair method seemed to be working, uh, but did it agree with the other methods of measuring the position angle and uh, uh, and separation and uh, using the uh, astrometric eyepiece and uh, and, and and um, excellent assistance from BA observers uh, I was happy that uh, my crosshair method is kind of <laughs> passed the test as it were and some observations, some observations of mine. Uh, in um, in my uh, educational uh, career, I've had lots of opportunity um, in sixth form colleges to uh, to teach astronomy, uh, GCSE astronomy, uh, A level options, and I, I often took the chance to run sessions with students using remote telescopes. And I think this is the one that uh, the system, the, uh, the, the, the setup that I've used the most, the Fox telescopes. Uh, they have two telescopes, one in the north in Hawaii, the other in the south siding spring. And uh, this is the one uh, I've, um, I've used for for students uh, and for double star observations, and uh, I was just um, looking up what this telescope has uh, has has pioneered, and it's it's a it's a two meter Ritchie Critian telescope as you can see at the top there, and this telescope measured the speed of rotation of the asteroid two thousand and eight HJ, which is then the fastest. Um, asteroid known. Um, I don't know if that's been overtaken. It probably has. And it was also the first telescope to observe an occultation of one of the moons of Eunice uh, by another. But uh, here's one of the double star observations I took with this um, telescope. Uh, I don't want to give the impression that I'm in the habit of observing double stars all the time with remote telescopes all over the world. But uh, these are ones that I did as uh, when I was in um, educational situations with uh, with students. <clears throat> and uh, this is uh, 61 Cygni. And what I'm mov moving over to now is to look at the um, software methods. Uh, Chris has very ably described uh, the power of software these days with Deep sky, um, uh, deep sky uh, targets, <clears throat> but uh, software can also help with extremely accurate measurements of the position angle and separation of double stars. And this is an image that I took with the Fox Hawaii telescope. Field of view about seven arc minutes there, and um, this was in twenty thirteen, and. 
there's some details there of the observation. Uh, what I did here, this is my own um, sketchbook, and I sketched this uh, from the image that I was able to download from the Fox telescope. Um, and there's, there is some software which I haven't used for a while now called Aladdin, but that, uh, that was very powerful and almost professional software. And what I did was um, take the, uh, the Fitz image from the Fox telescope, which um, n nearly always from these remote large telescopes uh, has a, a world coordinate system imposed on it, a WCS. In other words, it has the right ascension and declination grid imprinted on that image. And uh, for quite a, for quite a while, I used Aladdin uh, to measure position, angle, and double star uh, uh, separation of double stars. <clears throat> and what you can do is you just simply put the cursor on the primary star and stretch it across to the secondary star, and whoop, sorry, <laughs> and stretch it across to the secondary star. And the software gives you a very accurate reading of uh, the two parameters that you want. So you can repeat that and get um, uh, and get a, 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 an accurate measurement with an error. And there's my measurement, 31.7 plus or minus 0.2 and position angle 151.7 plus or minus 0.1. And the Washington double star catalog value is 31 and 151. So that's quite good. Um, more recently, I've used uh, the sky chart, uh, which was formerly known as the Carte de Ciel, and that does a similar thing: stretches a thread between two stars with a uh, with with a solved um, fits image. Um, the trouble is, my version of sky chart it doesn't seem to be working uh, with that function at the moment. I can't figure out why. Um, so I've been using the Open Use Open University. Um, software that they recommend uh, that I use with students, uh, Astro Image J. Uh, there is a, an app I've tried uh, called Astap, um, uh, but I didn't use that for very uh, for very long. Um, so uh, that's um, a software method of measuring these two parameters. Um, 61 Cygni, as we all know, these were the first stars to have their distances measured. And um, I'm associate lecturer with the Open University, and I've done quite a few years' experience with students on projects. And this is the uh, Open University's observatory on the top of Mount TD in uh, Tenerife. And I've, uh, I've imaged some double stars with these. And uh, this is one uh, using the coast. That's a, an acronym for the 17 inch DK, uh, which is, I think it's the nearer one on that last picture. I think it's this one here. And John, and, just to let you know, we're approaching half past. Yeah, I can just, I can see that, uh, Andrew. Yeah, this is my last uh, slide. No, it's not That's last but one slide. And uh, this is um, B18. I'll explain that in a minute. This is Iota Cancri in the constellation of uh, Cancer. And um, what I did with this, I found that um, with this image, I wasn't being able to stretch a thread across. So what I, what I did, I read off the right ascension and declination very accurately of both the primary and the secondary. And then just used a trigonometrical calculation um, written as a spreadsheet to calculate the, uh, the two uh, parameters, position, angle, and separation. And um, that's straightforward trigonometry. Anybody could do that. And my last slide, uh, uh, in the BA Journal June 2014 issue, I picked out uh, 101 of uh, the best um, double stars uh, from the Cambridge Atlas of Double Stars. And I'm just uh, trying to promote that as uh, kind of like a tick list for um, uh, for double star observing. And uh, that just about uh, takes me to the end, just about spot on. I'm sorry, I haven't left time for questions. 
Uh, but I'll finish at that point. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, John. Thanks so much, John. Um, if there's any quick questions, um, then uh, if you just want to quickly put them in the Q&A whilst we get Mark online. Um, but um, uh, I'll try and see if I can uh, um, get that uh, list from the uh, the BA Journal and put that up on the Deep Sky section website so that uh, if you want to uh, have a go at that list of double stars, then uh, then it'll be, be easily easily available. So I'll get that done for the, the update that comes out next month. Yeah. I know there's probably some complicated maths in there, so I think I might want to come and watch that back. <laughs> <laughs> it's not complicated. Uh, no, on... it's not, not that complicated <laughs> maths, but it's, 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 it's something that will take a little while to sink in, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so if we'll... Uh, not many questions for now, then uh, let's move on to our final... Um, speaker for the evening. Um, very glad to uh, welcome Mark Stewart, um, who's probably known to most folk in the deep sky world for his uh, galaxy hunting exploits and um, from, from, from rural Bristol. And um, he's going to talk to us tonight about, well, galaxy hunting. Over to you, Mark. Okay, let's uh, share. Check people can see that, all right? Everyone see that? Yep, see that okay? And hear you oh. fine. Okay. Well, thank you, um, John and Chris, for your presentations. I want to do a little bit of a link across. Um, Callum asked me to speak um, on galaxies, and he asked me, what do you want for your title for your talk, Mark? And I thought, what can I come up with? So I've got a confession, Callum. I went to ChatGPT, and I put in, what would be a good title for observing galaxies for a talk? And um, they came up with exploring the cosmic tapestry. So I've been doing a little bit of background to uh, enhance my talk to make sure I include uh, details about the cosmic tapestry as we go through. A definition for cosmos, I read uh, famous person Carl Sagan said, all that is or ever was or ever will be. And when you look up at the stars, Stephen Hawking said, and not down at your feet. Look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist. Be curious. Brian Cox said, you dig deeper and it gets more and more complicated and you get confused and it's tricky and hard, but it's beautiful. If you were to look at a galaxy every day of your life, you would see 36,500 approximately, and there are 2 trillion out of there. So just a little few thoughts about the cosmos before to whet your appetite before we go on. So here is, um, I'm going back old school. There are a few of us left um, with the big telescopes. Uh, I know uh, Owen's probably out there. Here is um, my latest telescope. There's another one behind me, which is an eight inch. And this came from Callum. Uh, before uh, Callum, it was a gentleman called Owen, who's also a very uh, um, keen deep sky observer. And this was the telescope I was given by Callum on the left. And as you can see there, a couple of big blue uh, square boxes. And um, you had to put a chair underneath one end to get it put together. And uh, it's a beautiful thing for those of us who are interested in telescopes, but it was very unwieldy. Um, so I uh, decided, what can I do about this to make it easier? And on the right is the uh, after image. At the top there, uh, is a drum. A uh, gentleman who sadly deceased um, was in the process of making a lovely drum. And I thought, well, hang on, lightweight um, is the right sort of uh, shape. I wonder what I can do with that. So that's the top end is um, a drum. And at the bottom end, a local box maker up in Gloucester said, I can make you a box. So I've got, that's he made the box. And um, I got some sash rollers, um, which you to do for the... Um, out motion and a lazy Susan for the azimuth, if you know what that is. And a couple of nights ago, I was out with it and I kept coming back to the eyepiece and it was moving and the wind was um, blowing the telescope around. So I'm going to have to slow it down a little bit. But that's uh, the somebody said the other day, I don't think there's much original left there, Callum. I think the mirrors are original and the spider 
uh, for the mirror is original, but everything else I think has been upgraded. I'm down near Bristol in magnitude five semi-rural skies. Uh, my house blocks the south, a hedge to the east, and I have typical Br British cloudy skies. So what I'm going to share with you tonight is in that, you know, uh, I'm not um, somewhere with a beautiful dark sky in, in a desert in Texas, etc. So just to share that. Over the last 14 years, I've been observing um, seen, uh, you know, over 2,000 galaxies from that sort of situation. And tonight, I'm just going to focus on Ursa Major, the plough, and there's a, I've seen 250 of those. Um, and that's more even than Virgo. Um, so as we go through, uh, we're going to go on a tour, and I'm going to be highlighting what you can see from with a telescope. I'm not going to put many finder maps up because I'm assuming you can go and have a look at those, but I hope you're going to enjoy the journey. So first of all, then, we're going to leave from Shetland from the new spaceport, Callum, up near Orkney. So you'll be pleased about that. Sorry, Chris, we're going. Um, we're not going in a probe. We're going to go in person. I know that might not necessarily be the best value for money approach, but we're going to go um, uh, by uh, spaceship tonight. Uh, in the picture there, you can see my son's um, Millennium Falcon in Lego that he's made and took a picture of for me. So we're going to be going in Millennium Falcon. And on the right, I'd like you all who are watching tonight to put on your helmets. Um, and that was made by a colleague called Dave Fraser. That's a resin helmet made using a silicon rubber mold, which was created using a cardboard template reinforced with fiberglass. So off we go on our tour out to the galaxies of Ursa Major. We need a map. Oh, no, that's the Ahsoka one for those who know about uh, Star Wars side of things. More seriously, we are going out to have a look at the plough tonight. That's the direction of travel we're going to be going in, exploring galaxies on our tour. Plough is visible all year round. And uh, on Tuesday night, it was quite low at sort of six, seven o'clock. But by nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, it was well up there in the right sort of direction for observing. So and just for Owen, who's probably watching online, there's no Caldwell galaxies in Ursa Major. I just thought he'd like me to mention that. So off we go. From a galactic perspective, this is our galaxy. We're on that picture there. We're going to be heading in the direction of the red arrow. So we're going to be going um, at a direction of 203 degrees in terms of uh, from away from the galactic center. And we're going to be going upward at 67, just for those who are interested in where we're going on our map. Um, we are on, uh, this is a map of the uh, galaxies in the night sky out to 45 million light years away. And we're going to be heading towards that circle, which is the Ursa Major direction, you can see they're marked M81, 101 and 51. And that comes from the large, large scale structures book in the universe by Anthony Farrell. So we're going to put our coordinates into our spaceship. Uh, see if you can guess where we're going tonight. RA11, declination plus 26 within the plow. Uh, if you want the galactic long coordinates, I mentioned 203 degrees, 67 up. And the super galactic coordinates, we're going below the um, galactic plane. So off we go. Uh, initially, we're going to be traveling at apparently 3,000 light years per hour, according to my research on the Millennium Falcon, for those who are interested. And after a few seconds, we notice something out the window. Somebody shouts, and I just thought I'd mention this. We're passing in um, Ursa Major. We're passing Leyland 21185. Look at that old Burnham's book there. And there's a little map on the right, just underneath um, 51 Ursa Major, 8.5 light years away. Um, it's a dim red dwarf star. It's one of the fourth closest stars to our system. It's magnitude seven, so you'll need binoculars. And in 20,000 years, it will be under five light years away from us and will be the closest star system to us at that point. And there are two planets. Just shortly after that, a few more seconds and we pass a double star. This was for John. I think it was number 98 on your list, John. Um, we're passing XI Ursa Majoris. And this is my humble attempt at <laughs> what it might look like. Um, it's um, a, about two arc seconds. It's a very close double if you look at it uh, with a telescope. And um, it's also featured in the April 2008 Web Double Star of the Month. Uh, if you see a little sticker on the bottom right, Web Deep Society, so, so you can look that up if you're interested. On we go towards the galaxies and we pass through. Um, after 30 seconds, we pass the Ursa Major Moving Group, a group of 60 stars, um, majority of the bright stars in the plough. And looking back, we can 
Uh, already no longer see our sun because it's a weak yellow dwarf star and it's gone. So we're on we go past the Perseus arm of our galaxy. And interestingly, if you look at that, I don't know what you think, uh, galaxy people. Uh, apparently it looks uh, quite flocculent in nature to me. That's fluffy. Um, looks interestingly. Apparently uh, there was a BAA talk on galaxies and in 2021 there was some Hubble findings that maybe our galaxy is flocculent. Uh, the Perseus arm 6,400 light years away, so we're on our way out. It contains M36, 37, 38, 52, 103, and the Crab Nebula. So onward we go. Callum shouts, what's that down to the left? And I, uh, he likes uh, globular clusters, so just mention this on the way out. 340,000 light years out. Well, it's not where we're going. In magnitude 14, uh, they thought it was a they thought it was um, a double cluster and then uh, we thought it was a galaxy original. So I thought I was OK to let it in, uh, Callum. It's one of the most distant globular clusters known. So we're going out towards the galaxies. We're going to have to go a bit faster than Millennium Falcon to get to the galaxies. So we're now going to attach ourselves to the hyperspace booster to complete our tour tonight. Um, we're going to be accelerating to near light speed rather than bending space time for those who are concerned. Things behind us will get fainter and redder and slow down and things ahead of us will get brighter, bluer and speed up and gradually concentrate down to a bright point of light. The lights from our ship, though, if you point them out in the front, will still push light out of the speed of light regardless of how fast we go. And things around us may appear to start to rotate. But don't be alarmed. That's just the Terrell Penrose effect. Uh, by going to the near speed of light, our journey this evening will seem to be about half an hour. So just to let you know. And finally, here we are. We have got some galaxies. So the first galaxies we've come across as we're on our way out is the M81 group. Um, it's not our final destination. The observations that I've got there on the slide are based on semi-rural magnitude five skies and the details of group members from the Richard Powell's Atlas of the Universe site. I was out there the other night. Um, M80, this is for people who have just got binoculars or a small telescope. Uh, M81, M82 are really bright, visible in binoculars. Beautiful pair. I could see them both in my eyepiece last night, my low power eyepiece. Um, dark lanes are visible on M82. There's a double star on the little image there on M81. I don't know if it's optical or I'll have to ask John whether it's an optical or a real one, probably an optical one. And there's a couple of other galaxies, M uh, NGC 3077, which is a bright circular object, which is pretty easy to see. But I struggled with 2976 last night. Um, my friend Owen will tell you that I'm fairly realistic about you, what you can see and not, not say what you can't. But there's a prominent field star next to it. So on we go, just mindful of our time because we want to get to our destination. As we go out, a bit of cosmic tapestry for you. Um, did you know that around our galaxy, there is a council of giants? galaxies. I didn't know this till recently. There are around uh, about 12 million light years in all directions. All around us, we are guarded by the Council of Giants, the galaxies. They're on the plane. They're all in a line there, if you look at it side on. And M81 and M82 are one of the Council of Giants, as well as 94, 64, 83, uh, and a, a couple of others you can see. So that was something interesting that I didn't know until I uh, prepared for this talk. Onward we go. We're now 25 million light years out and we pass the M101 group. These pictures are from a renowned EAA observer from near me called Chris Lee. Um, and you can see there is his images of 51, 101 and 63. Again, very difficult to see 101 unless you've got a good sky. And if you've got a, a better sky and a big telescope, you can see some of the more of the details of the uh, uh, star formation areas and the arms. More details available on the Web Society Galaxy of the Month section 2018. And a couple of ones there I've mentioned are outside the plough, but I just couldn't miss them out, MA51 and 63. Um, you can see the one down the bottom is called Flocculent again, I mentioned it earlier. They don't really know quite how this happens. There's a lot of things we don't know about uh, galaxies and we don't really fully know, although it's to do with self-propagating star formation, why those form like that. Also, if you look in the other two galaxies on the left there, you can see what appears to be uh, lines. So you get a, 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 it gets various lines going on there, which are called um, Vorontsov Valley Monof rows, where they get these weird straight lines that they don't understand that are going on. So lots of things we don't understand, but go out very, very good ones to observe as we go out further into the night, into the into the plow. As we go further on. Uh, we got to 20 to 30 million, million light years out. Now we go past a local filament. Uh, the galaxy tapestry is made up of filaments and there is one local to us. And there's a little picture of it from um, uh, an article. 
uh, showing M63, 51, 101, and 6503, which is also a very nice um, galaxy to look at in Draco. Down the bottom, SGL doesn't stand for Stargazer's Lounge, but Super Galactic Lounge. Look, uh, la I get this right, Super Galactic Latitude. And this line of galaxies, interestingly, you can see the circles overlapping. Apparently, M101, M51, and M63 are all going to collide, a bit like the um, R galaxy with Andromeda. So, there's something I, I wasn't fully aware of. A uh, couple of favourites on the way out. Uh, we're now at 46 million light years, 2841. I had a look at this the other night. You can just see there, there's a field star in the midst of the halo. So it looks like they've got a fake supernova, people might, but it's easy enough to see. I can see it in 80 millimetre binoculars. It is the, one of the top five brightest galaxies in Ursa Major. So have a go at that one. Um, and just to compare with Chris Lee's beautiful photograph there. I thought I'd show you this. I love my old books. This is the 1995 Carnegie Atlas of Galaxies. And this is a picture from 1951 of 2841 using the 200 inch Mount Palmar telescope. So on we go. Uh, the next shell, we're, we're out towards 45 to 90 uh, million light years out. And we come to the Ursa Major North and South group. Um, this is 80 galaxies scattered across an oval area of the sky on our way out. And there's a few ideas there. You can come back and have a look at these slides afterwards and pick some of those out to have a look at. Beautiful picture there by Greg Ruppel in the bottom right, which is a beautiful edge on scope. I love beautiful edge on scopes, uh, edge on galaxies. I love um doubles there's one there 3998 is very bright but 3900 is a little bit more difficult and a few other ideas for you to have a look at um, in the region 60 to 80 as we carry on out um as we, we go out further we come to the lynx ursa major filament and i just want to mention this this is how far away the galaxies are that i've observed in ursa major and you can see the sort of range there um and there are um, 67 galaxies in the 100 to 300 a million light years. Uh, it, we, some of these objects may be in what's called the Lynx Ursa Major filament, but a little graph at the bottom left. And on the right, I've suggested a couple of ideas there in this area from 100 to 300 million light years. 3415 is beautiful when you see a galaxy next to stars. Um, I often find the contrast between dots and the fuzzies lovely. And there's a there's one for you to have a go at and a little a group there. 3994. Apparently, um, there's a dark lane in 3991, which some people claim to see, but I can only just see the, the galaxy. So as a suggestion, carry on out. Um, we then come to a void uh, called the Ursa Major Void. Uh, this is about 300 million light years away, and then it's 130 million light years across. This is a, not a picture of the void. It's a, off the internet of a void. It's a hot area at the moment. We now know 6,000 voids, and some of them are expanding faster than space itself, and they don't understand. So... Um, people are really fascinated by voids at the moment, but if we're on the void, we can see some more points. So let's carry on and out. Um, I wanted to point this one out, which is a beautiful, special thing. I remember observing this at a, a one of those uh, star parties. It's uh, near and far. There are two galaxies there at 40 million light years and the little group to the bottom right at 400. It's amazing to see the difference. Uh, when you see that, it is really special, and it's in the Web Society Deep Sky Galaxy of the Month, April 2011, if you'd like to have a little bit more detail on that one. And uh, they're uh, carrying on out further. We're up to 400 million light years out. Here's an observation of um, Markarian 421, which is uh, a very, very bright object, nucleus. Um, it's uh, a stellar object, but it's just an incredible object to see and i couldn't see obviously the secondary galaxy there carry on just mindful of time we have now arrived at our destination don't know how many of you guessed this one so this is our destination tonight it is 430 million light years away it's um pretty much with a, a telescope from without having electronically assisted uh, uh things like chris has got which maybe i'll get when i retire as well uh, from a visual perspective, you're, you're getting to the distance you can see with regard to galaxies uh, themselves as opposed to quasars. And this is a cluster which is in Ursa Major, and it is um, part of the LEO supercluster. It is one of the largest structures known in the universe. I would like to apologise for your late arrival at this um, cluster. The galaxy was 38 million light years further away than our maps indicated. We set our coordinates using a Hubble constant of 73 kilometers per second, which is the latest James Webb Space Telescope Hubble estimate. But it now looks like the 
uh, CMB background figure of 67.5 is more accurate. If we just did some maths there, that's why uh, I'd like to apologize for that. Redshift of this uh, object is only 0.03. We're still only an, a small fraction of the way out. Um, it is quite incredible to think that even though we're out now at 430 and we're as far away as we can see with my 20 inch telescope broadly, we're still only at a redshift of 0.03. It's in the web book of clusters of galaxy. And there's a lot of interesting action going on there. I can't see, as you'll see, the guitar galaxy there. I'm just going to pull this on. Just for um, uh, just for Callum, I wanted to say they've recently found there are loads and loads and loads of globular clusters, about 1,300 of them, Callum, that are not associated with any particular galaxy. They just seem to be loose in the cluster, and they just don't quite know what's going on there. So I thought that's quite an interesting point to mention. Here is my observation of the group back in uh, February uh, 2021 with the telescope. By the way, the scope is called the Eddy um, in honour of um, a gentleman, Eddie Carpenter, who used to live near me. So just to say that's the name of my scope. And I could find um, four of the galaxies, I thought, until I then found a double object, which I thought was a double star, John, but it turned out to be a star and a galaxy. Um, so actually it's five. It's in the, This is in the web, um, March 2022 galaxy of the month. And um, it's the most galaxies I could see in one field of view in the plough. And that's at 430 million years, light years away. Just a few more uh, tapestry thoughts now, now that we're out at that distance. First of all, I've only seen 250 galaxies in the plough. So I thought 0.6% uh, of what is on the NED uh, galactic database. So I downloaded all 40,000 galaxies in the plough uh, that are less than 650 million light years away. So I've got a lot of more observing to do. And I put them into, it took 45 minutes, and I put them into trusty Excel being an accountant. That's what you do. And then I used some conditional formatting and got it to show me where all the galaxies are and put the dots on. It was a bit difficult because Excel's uh, vertical and not um, got the right projection, shall we say. But it gave you a feel for it. And it's really interesting there. You can see that above the plow, um, it's less dense. If you uh, were coming on to the... Uh, in a minute, I'm just going to show you the Hubble Deep Field, which is in this area, but maybe they should have gone a bit further up, um, where maybe it would have been even even less dense than where they took the uh, image. Down the bottom left there, you can see in the red circle, the Coma Cluster, where there's 688 galaxies in the square. You can see the numbers there, eight, nine, seven, there's 688 in that blue dot. So that's the Coma Cluster, gives you a feel. And the other... Uh, circle to the right is where we are. we've arrived, which is Abel 1185. There's a hundred galaxies in that uh, blue square down the bottom there. So I thought you might might be interested in that. A couple more minutes. Onto the Hubble Deep Field. Uh, looking further out from where we are, we can see into space. There is plenty more out there, but as we can't see them from Earth or observe them without EAA. There you are, Chris. I don't know whether you've seen any of those with your put your uh, electronically assisted on that area to see what you can see. Um, but the brightest galaxy there, I think, is magnitude 20, 20 or 22. Um, so it might be a bit difficult even with your kit, Chris. I don't know. Final few slides. Here's some more tapestry. Oh, no, this is why my wife's knitting. That's better. Here's the tapestry of the uh, observable universe, which is interesting that you can see it looks more like the, the knitting or a sponge at the beginning, and then it gets less and less uh, regular. And um, I'm sure Chris will tell you, he's done a talk recently, I think, at this on the new space telescope called Euclid, which is going out there to map better. Sorry, I went a bit too fast there. Going back, here you go. If we came back the way we came, um, not much time has passed for us because we've just done our 25 minutes, but on Earth, um, millions of years have gone past. So the only way we can go back to... Uh, where we started in Shetland at the time is to use the TARDIS. So we're going to go back on the TARDIS to go back. And the, my last slide, I hope on the next clear moonless night, you will have a go at looking for some of the things I've mentioned there. I haven't seen PAL4, by the way, Callum, I've tried. I will have another go, but I hope you might have a go at M81, 2841. Maybe have a look at that uh, galaxy with a triangle, a 3415 or the edge on 4026. Have a go at 101 or the Markarian object, or maybe even try, um, and I did this for, uh, for um, Owen as well. I called it its proper name, ACO1185. So, Get out there and observe. 
I hope I've whetted your appetite and I hope you enjoyed my presentation. So I will stop sharing and hand back. Thank you, Mark. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Thanks so much. Um, just just on, on the 20 inch telescope, by the way, just to let you know, I did replace the secondary. Um, and I had it, so it's uh, it's uh, the, from the from the very very original telescope. It's probably only the main mirror is the only thing that's, been, that's left. <laughs> and we're starting to get some questions or comments in. First off, um, Steve Brown on YouTube says the most distant object he's known knowingly seen visually is Messier's fifty eight at sixty eight million light years away. Well done. That's um, it's really interesting to see how far you can go. Obviously, with quasars, three C two seven three, and others, you can go further. But in terms of galaxies, you, once you get to about four hundred or five hundred million light years, even the really bright CD galaxies, you know, become difficult for me. I guess if you um, go somewhere like Texas or whatever, you'll go further, and you maybe get six, seven, maybe a billion. They talk about, don't they? But I'm realistic from semi-rural near Bristol. Four or five hundred million light years is about my limit, but sixty is well done on that. That's brilliant. And we have a comment from David saying, "Fantastic, entertaining journey whizzing through the cosmos. Uh, beats sitting at a telescope in the cold any night." Just wants to know when he can book another trip. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I thought it would be a uh, nice to just to make it a bit entertaining as well as hopefully informative. Not any questions coming through yet. Again, you can use the Q&A at the bottom on Zoom and in the comments on YouTube. And also if you have any questions for John or, or as well, Chris. Uh -huh. we have. Uh... I, I'm just going to share my screen. I realised one, one picture I didn't share. I wasn't sure I was going to add to it, but uh, Mark, Mark actually indicated it. Um, that was my picture of the guitar, which is not very good. <laughs> so you can just about see the strep work up there, but that is at least the you know some of the, the ABAR stuff. So um, well done for picking that one up then, Mark. We have a comment from Owen Brazil who said that he's seen PAL4 a number of times. Uh, one of the comments you made, Mark, um, I reckon the faintest magnitude I can see is about 17 and a half, maybe 18, but not not anything uh, better than that. Yeah, and I've, I've done some work observing um, active galaxies. Of course, just with, with those, they're, they're not quite as um, interesting because they tend to be point sources, but you can go a long way with them. And from Nick Hewitt, um, just saying, good fun and enjoyable webinar. Well, I think um, we need to quieten down now. People are wanting to get out and observe tonight. I don't know if it's clear where you are. Um, it's not clear here, but uh, at least it wasn't when I came, in, came out. Right. I um, fear that uh, in the southwest we may have lost the clear nights for a little while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think there are parts of the country supposed to be clear tonight, but uh, it will no doubt be quite cold as well. Um, anyway, so we'll, we'll, we'll wrap things up there. Thanks very much to uh, to Chris, to John and Mark for all of their uh, talks tonight. It's been really much, really appreciated. Um, next uh, Deep Sky Section meeting is our uh, in-person uh, meeting on March the 16th in Northampton. At the Humphrey Rooms, uh, kindly uh, being hosted by the Northampton Natural History Society's astronomy section. Uh, and uh, I'll look forward to seeing many of you there. I've booked my flights down, so uh, I should be there on the day uh, and hope to see a, few, see a few of you then. 
Um, for the details on that will be coming out on the website fairly soon. Uh, and uh, we've already got a, a fairly good, uh, well, a fair, a fair, sorry. we've already got a great lineup of speakers, and I just have to add an extra professional onto the onto the onto the set. Um, and to to finish that off, um, so um, we'll be looking forward to that, and uh, I look forward to seeing many of you down there at uh, on that date, uh, assuming of course that uh, the weather isn't too bad and the flights actually take off and. So other, other such things, but uh, I'm sure we'll, sure we'll get there. Anyway, um, thanks very much for attending tonight. And uh, many thanks to Andy for organising all the IT support stuff. Uh, and thank you all for uh, for, for viewing. And uh, uh, we'll uh, see you again in the near future. Thanks, Good night. Good night, everyone. And uh, just to note, not long until the next BAA meeting, which is on Saturday the 20th of January, at the Institute of Physics. And we, we hope to have that on YouTube as well for those who can't attend in person. Thank you, bye. Thanks all. Thanks and all.